The name Pelasgians was used by some ancient Greek writers to refer to populations that were either the ancestors of the Greeks or preceded the Greeks in Greece, a holdall term for any ancient, primitive and presumably indigenous people in the Greek world. In general, Pelasgian has come to mean more broadly all the indigenous inhabitants of the Aegean Sea region and their cultures before the advent of the Greek language. During the Classical period, enclaves under that name survived in several locations of mainland Greece, Crete, and other regions of the Aegean. Populations identified as Pelasgian spoke a language or languages that at the time Greeks identified as barbaric. Even though some ancient writers described the Pelasgians as Greeks, a tradition also survived that large parts of Greece had once been Pelasgian before being Hellenized. These parts generally fell within the ethnic domain that, by the 5th century BC, was attributed to those speakers of ancient Greek who were identified as Ionians. Etymology. Much like all other aspects of the Pelasgians, their ethnonym is of extremely uncertain provenance and etymology. Michel Sakalariou collects 15 different etymologies proposed for it by philologists and linguists during the last 200 years, though he admits that most dot are fanciful. An ancient etymology based on mere similarity of sounds linked Pelasgos to Pelagos and postulates that the Pelasgians were migrants like storks possibly from Egypt, where they nest. Aristophanes deals effectively with this etymology in his comedy The Birds, one of the laws of the storks, in the satirical cloud cuckoo land, playing upon the Athenian belief that they were originally Pelasgians, is that grown-up storks must support their parents by migrating elsewhere and conducting warfare. Gilbert Murray summarizes the derivation from Pelas GE. If Pelasgoi is connected with Pi Epsilon Lambda Alpha Sigma, near, the word would mean neighbor and would denote the nearest strange people to the invading Greeks. Julius Pocorni derives Pelasgoi from asterisk Pelagskoi, specifically inhabitants of the Thessalian plain. He details a previous derivation, which appears in English at least as early as William Gladstone's studies on Homer and the Homeric Age. If the Pelasgians were not Indo-Europeans, the name in this derivation must have been assigned by the Hellenes. The ancient Greek word for sea, Pelagos, comes from the same root, asterisk plaque, as the Doric word plagos, side, appearing in asterisk pelagskoi. Ernest Klein therefore simply interprets the same reconstructed form as the sea men, where the sea is the flat. Klein's interpretation does not require the Indo-Europeans to have had a word for sea, which living on the inland plains they are likely to have lacked. On encountering the sea they simply use the word for plain, the flat. The flatlanders also could acquire what must have been to the Hellenes a homonym, the sea men. Best of all, if the Egyptians of the late Bronze Age encountered maritime marauders under this name they would have translated as sea people. Ancient Literary Evidence Literary analysis has been going on since classical Greece when the writers of those times read previous works on the subject. No definitive answers were ever forthcoming by this method, rather, it served to define the problems better. The method perhaps reached a peak in the Victorian era when new methods of systematic comparison began to be applied in philology. Typical of the era is the long and detailed study of William Ewart Gladstone, who among his many talents was a trained classicist. Until further ancient texts come to light, advances on the subject cannot be made. The most likely source of progress regarding the Pelasgians continues to be archaeology and related sciences. Poets Homer the Pelasgians first appear in the poems of Homer. Those who are stated to be Pelasgians in the Iliad are among the allies of Troy. In the section known as the Catalogue of Trojans, 
They are mentioned between mentions of the Hellespont and cities and the Thracians of southeastern Europe. Homer calls their town or district Larissa, and characterizes it as fertile, and its inhabitants as celebrated for their spearsmanship. He records their chiefs as Hippot House and Peleus, sons of Lethus, son of Teutomuse, thus giving all of them names that were Greek or so thoroughly Hellenized that any foreign element has been effaced. In the Odyssey, Odysseus, affecting to be Cretan himself, instances Pelasgians among the tribes in the ninety cities of Crete, language mixing with language side by side. Last on his list, Homer distinguishes them from other ethnicities on the island, Cretans proper, Achaeans, Sidonians, Dorians, and noble Pelasgians. The Iliad also refers to Pelasgicargos which is most likely to be the plain of Thessaly, and to Pelasgic Zeus, living in and ruling over Dodona, which must be the oracular one in Epirus. However, neither passage mentions actual Pelasgians, Mimidans, Hellenes, and Achaeans specifically inhabit Thessaly and the Seloia around Dodona. They all fought on the Greek side. According to the Iliad, Pelasgians were camping out on the shore together with the following tribes. Towards the sea lie the Carians and the Paeonians, with curved bows, and the Lelages and Corcones, and the goodly Pelasgi. He should later Greek writers offered little unanimity over which sites and regions were Pelasgian. One of the first was Hesiod, he calls the oracular Dodona, identified by reference to the oak, the seat of Pelasgians, clarifying Homer's Pelasgic Zeus. He mentions also that Pelasgus was the father of King Lycon of Arcadia. Asius of Samos Asius of Samos describes Pelasgus as the first man born of the earth. Aeschylus in Aeschylus's play, The Suppliants, the Danaids fleeing from Egypt seek asylum from King Pelasgus of Argos, which he says is on the stream and including Peribia in the north, the Thessalian Dodona and the slopes of the Pindus Mountains on the west and the shores of the sea on the east, that is, a territory including but somewhat larger than classical Pelis Jotis. The southern boundary is not mentioned, however, Apus is said to have come to Argos from now Pactis, across, implying that Argos includes all of East Greece from the north of Thessaly to the Peloponnesian Argos, where the Danaids are probably to be conceived as having landed. He claims to rule the Pelasgians and to be the child of Palicthon whom the earth brought forth. The Danaids call the country the Apian Hills, and claim that it understands the Carbana or Dan, which many translators barbarian speech, but Carba is in fact a non-Greek word. They claim to descend from ancestors in ancient Argos even though they are of a dark race. Pelasgus admits that the land was once called Apia, but compares them to the women of Libya and Egypt and wants to know how they can be from Argos on, which they cite descent from Io. In a lost play by Aeschylus, Danan women, he defines the original homeland of the Pelasgians as the region around Mycenae. Sophocles Sophocles presents Anacus, in a fragment of a missing play entitled Anacus, as the elder in the lands of Argos. The here and hills and among the Tizenwa Pelasgoi, an unusual hyphenated noun construction, Ticenians Pelasgians. Interpretation is open, even though translators typically make a decision, but Ticenians may well be the ethnonym Terenoi. Euripides Euripides calls the inhabitants of Argos Pelasgians in his play entitled Orestes. In a lost play entitled Archelaus, he says that Danaeus, on coming to reside in the city of Anacus, formulated a law whereby the Pelasgians were now to be called Danaunts. Ovid the Roman poet Ovid describes the Greeks of the Trojan War as Pelasgians in his Metamorphoses. Sadly his father, Priam, mourned for him, not knowing that young Isacus had assumed wings on his shoulders, and was yet alive. Then also Hector with his brothers made complete but unavailing sacrifice, upon a tomb which bore his carved name. Paris was absent, but soon afterwards, he brought into that land a ravished wife, Helen, the cause of a disastrous war, together with a thousand ships.
and all the great Pelasgian nation, here, when a sacrifice had been prepared to Jove, according to the custom of their land, and when the ancient altar glowed with fire. The Greeks observed an azure-colored snake crawling up in a plain tree near the place where they had just begun their sacrifice. Among the highest branches was a nest, with twice four birds and those the serpent seized together with the mother bird as she was fluttering round her loss, and every bird the serpent buried in his greedy maw. All stood amazed, but Calchas, who perceived the truth, exclaimed, Rejoice, Pelasgian men! for we shall conquer, Troy will fall, although the toil of war must long continue so the nine birds equal nine long years of war, and while he prophesied, the serpent, coiled about the tree, was transformed to a stone, curled crooked as a snake, historians Hecateus of Miletus Hecateus of Miletus in a fragment from Genealogy states that the genos descending, from Deucalion ruled Thessaly and that it was called Pelasgia, from King Pelasgus. A second fragment says that Pelasgus was the son of Zeus and Niobe and that his son Lycon founded a dynasty of kings of Arcadia, Hellenicus Hellenicus of Mytilene, in fragment 7 of the Argolica, concerns himself with one word in one line of the Iliad, pasture land of horses, applied to Argos in the Peloponnesus. What is said about it is reported by different authors in all accounts differ. The explanation is trivial and mythical, but all accounts agree Hellenicus said the term Argia or Argolis once applied to all Peloponnesus and that Pelasgus and his two brothers received it as an inheritance from their father, named either Triopar, Aristor or Feronius. Pelasgus built the citadel Larissa of Argos on the Erasinus River, whence the name Pelasgic Argos, but later resettled inland, built Parasia and named the region or caused it to be named Pelasgia, to be renamed Arcadia with the coming of the Greeks. According to fragment 76 of Hellenicus's Pharaonus, from Pelasgus and his wife Manipa came a line of kings, Phrastor, Amantor, Teutamides and Nassus. The Pelasgians under Nassus rose up against the Hellenes and departed for Italy where they first took Cortona and then founded Tyrrhenia. The conclusion is that Hellenicus believed the Pelasgians of Thessaly to have been the ancestors of the Etruscans. Herodotus in the Histories, the Greek historian Herodotus of Halicarnassus wrote, with uncertainty, about the language of the Pelasgians. I am unable to state with certainty what language the Pelasgians spoke, but we could consider the speech of the Pelasgians who still exist in settlements above Tyrrhenia in the city of Creston, formerly neighbours to the Dorians who at that time lived in the land now called Thessaly it is, also the Pelasgians who once lived with the Athenians and then settled Play Kiran Sky Lake in the Hellespont, and along with those who lived with all the other communities and were once Pelasgian but changed their names. If one can judge by this evidence, the Pelasgians spoke a barbarian language. And so, if the Pelasgian language was spoken in all these places, the people of Attica being originally Pelasgian, must have learned a new language when they became Hellenes. As a matter of fact, the people of Crestonia and Plaikia no longer speak the same language, which shows that they continue to use the dialect they brought with them when they migrated to those lands. Herodotus alludes to other districts, where Pelasgian peoples lived on under changed names, Samothracian, the Pelasgian city of Antandris, in the Trode probably provide instances of this. He mentions that there were Pelasgian populations on the islands of Lemnos and Imbros. Those of Lemnos he represents as being of Hellespont and of Pelasgians who had been living in Athens but whom the Athenians resettled on Lemnos and then found it necessary to reconquer. This expulsion of Pelasgians from Athens may reflect, according to the historian Robert Buck, a dim memory of forwarding of refugees closely akin to the Athenians in speech and custom, to the Ionian colonies. 
Herodotus also mentions the Kaberi, the gods of the Pelasgians, whose worship gives an idea of where the Pelasgians once were. Another claim made by Herodotus entails the Hellenes having separated from the Pelasgians with the former surpassing the Latin numerically. As for the Hellenes, it seems obvious to me that ever since they came into existence they have always used the same language. They were weak at first, when they were separated from the Pelasgians, but they grew from a small group into a multitude, especially when many peoples, including other barbarians in great numbers, had joined them. Moreover, I do not think the Pelasgian, who remained barbarians, ever grew appreciably in number or power. He states that the Pelasgians of Athens were called Cranae, and that the Pelasgian population among the Ionians of the Peloponnesus were the Aegealian Pelasgians. Moreover, Herodotus mentions that the Aeolians, according to the Hellenes, were known anciently as Pelasgians. Thucydides in the history of the Peloponnesian War, the Greek historian Thucydides wrote about the Pelasgians stating that, before the time of Helen, son of Deucalion, the country went by the names of the different tribes, in particular of the Pelasgian. It was not till Helen and his sons grew strong in Thyatus, and were invited as allies into the other cities that one by one they gradually acquired from the connection the name of Hellenes, though a long time elapsed before that name could fasten itself. Upon all, he regards the Athenians as having lived in scattered independent settlements in Attica but at some time after Theseus they changed residence to Athens which was already populated. A plot of land below the Acropolis was called Pelasgian and was regarded as cursed, but the Athenians settled there anyway. In connection with the campaign against Amphipolis, Thucydides mentions that several settlements on the promontory of ACTE were home to mixed barbarian races speaking the two languages. There is also a small Chalcidian element, but the greater number of tyrrheno pelasgians once settled in Lemnos and Athens, and by Saltians, Crestonians and Aeonians, the towns all being small ones, Ephorus the historian Ephorus, building on a fragment from Hesiod that attests to a tradition of an aboriginal Pelasgian people in Arcadia developed a theory of the Pelasgians as a people living military way of life, and that, in converting many peoples to the same mode of life, they imparted their name to all, meaning, all of Hellas. They colonized Crete and extended their rule over Epirus, Thessaly and by implication over wherever else the ancient authors said they were, beginning with Homer. The Peloponnese was called Pelasgia. Dionysius of Halicarnassus in the Roman Antiquities. Dionysius of Halicarnassus in several pages gives a synoptic interpretation of the Pelasgians based on the sources available to him then, concluding that Pelasgians were Greek. Afterwards some of the Pelasgians who inhabited Thessaly, as it is now called, being obliged to leave their country, settled among the Aborigines and jointly with them made war upon the Sicils. It is possible that the Aborigines received them partly in the hope of gaining their assistance, but I believe it was chiefly on account of their kinship, for the Pelasgians, too, were a Greek nation originally from the Peloponnesus, he goes on to add that the nation wandered a great deal, they were originally natives of Archeonagos, descended from Pelasgus, the son of Zeus and Niobe. They migrated from there to Hemonia, where they drove out the barbarian inhabitants and divided the country into Thyatus, Acharia, and Pelasgotus, named after Achaeus, Theus and Pelasgus, the sons of Larissa and Poseidon. Subsequently, about the sixth generation they were driven out by the Curts and Lelagers, who are now called Aetolians and Locrians. From there, the Pelasgians dispersed to Crete, the Cyclades, Hysteriotis, Boeotia, Phasis, Euboea, the coast along the Hellespont and the islands especially Lesbos, which had been colonized by Makar son of Crinicus. Most went to Dodona and eventually being driven from there to Italy then called Saturnia. They landed at Spina at the mouth of the Po River. Still others crossed the Apennine Mountains to Umbria and being driven from there went to the country of the Aborigines. 
These consented to a treaty and settled them at Velia. They and the Aborigines took over Umbria but were dispossessed by the Tyrrhenians. The author continues to detail the tribulations of the Pelasgians and then goes on to the Tyrrhenians, whom he is careful to distinguish from the Pelasgians. Upon becoming king, Pelasgus was responsible for inventing huts, sheepskin coats, and a diet consisting of acorns. Moreover, the land he ruled was named Pelasgia. When Arca became king, Pelasgia was renamed Arcadia, and its inhabitants were renamed Arcadians. Pausanias also mentions the Pelasgians as responsible for creating a wooden image of Orpheus in a sanctuary of Demeter at Thera, as well as expelling the Minions and Lacedaemonians from Lemnos. Strabo Strabo dedicates a section of his geography to the Pelasgians, relating both his own opinions and those of prior writers. Of his own opinions he says, as for the Pelasgi, almost all agree, in the first place, that some ancient tribe of that name spread throughout the whole of Greece, and particularly among the Aeolians of Thessaly, he defines Pelasgianagos as being between the outlets of the Peneus River and Thermopylae as far as the mountainous country of Pindus, and states that it took its name from Pelasgian rule. He includes also the tribes of Epirus as Pelasgians. Lesbos is named Pelasgian. Cara was settled by Pelasgians from Thessaly, who called it by its former name, Aegila. Pelasgians also settled around the mouth of the Tiber River in Italy at Pyrgi and a few other settlements under a king, Melios. Mythology in 1955, Robert Graves in his mythography The Greek Myths claims that the Pelasgian creation myth involves a singular creatrix goddess who dominates man and predates other deities. The goddess gives birth to all things, fertilized not by any male opposite but by symbolic seeds in the form of the wind, beans, or insects. 